All right, we're going to build a new model of international trade. And our objective in using this model is in several fold. The new model is going to be simpler than Edgeworth boxes and upside down individuals and utility and difference curves and things like that. Instead, we're going to talk about trade in the context of simple supply and demand curves. All right, so that's going to make our jobs a little bit simpler. The first thing we're going to do is talk about, in the context of these new models, what are the effects or implications or impacts of international trade? Like what happens in a supply and demand structure when a country simply opens up to trade with the rest of the world? And what we'll see in our analysis is that from a market perspective, there's actually going to be winners and losers that are likely to arise. We want to identify those winners and losers, and we want to come up with a way of measuring the degree of gains and losses that are accruing to the different groups. And we're going to want to be able to assess what is the market effect, the summation of the gains and losses across different groups, to see whether trade is a good thing or a bad thing from an aggregate <coughs> perspective. Okay, so that's our objective. What does trade do, and in particular, what does trade do to prices? What does it do to the quantities, supply and demand? What does it do to the well-beings or welfares of individuals who are engaging in that particular market? And what does it do for the country overall when we add up the gains and losses across different groups? So that's our, our, um, our objective. Now, we're going to do this in two different contexts. The first context, we're going to imagine that a country is a small entity with respect to the rest of the world, what we call a small country. And in the small country case, it's going to be kind of like a firm in perfect competition. Namely, we're going to imagine that a country is too small to have any meaningful influence over the price and the quantities of the goods that are sold in the rest of the world market. Kind of like when a firm in perfect competition enters and begins producing a particular good. Any firm that produces something or decides not to produce something, their quantity is imagined in a perfect competition setting to be too small to influence the price, which is why they take the price as given, knowing they can't really affect it. We're going to do the same thing with international trade, and we're going to imagine that first countries might be very, very small in the world and see what the implications of trade and tariffs. That's the other thing I forgot to mention. We're going to also look at the effects of tariffs or taxes at the border to see what protectionism is likely to do in these markets as well. We're then going to move on, and this, we'll talk about large country cases. Large country cases more like the United States or the EU or Japan or Brazil. Countries that, through their exposure to international trade, either through exports or imports, have a big enough share of the international market to actually affect what the price of the market is. And we're going to see in that context, actually, that a country putting a tariff into place and protecting its internal market could actually raise up the overall well-being of citizens within its country. In other words, I'm going to give you some arguments for why trade can work out to be a good, I'm sorry, protectionism could turn out to be a good thing for countries. And I'll give you some examples of that as we go along. Now, I'm going to introduce to you some welfare measurements. The way we're going to measure the well-being of participants in the market is using concepts called producer and consumer surplus. So first, let's talk about consumer surplus. Remember from the Edgeworth box that we've got, anytime you've got sales taking place in the marketplace, you've got sellers and buyers, uh, producers of the goods and consumers of the goods, coming together and trading objects between them. Most of the time, the trades are money in exchange for the goods. But as a result of a trade, any kind of a mutually voluntary trade in a marketplace, both sides are walking away with something they want more than the thing they came to the market with. And therefore, they're both enjoying an increase in surplus value as a result of that trade. So both producers and consumers are earning a surplus. Now, consumer surplus can be found or derived by looking at a demand curve in a particular market. I've got price on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis. We might measure quantity in pounds. We might measure the price in dollars per pound, as an example. Let's imagine we have a nice downward sloping demand curve like this. And for the moment, let's just imagine that the price in the market, that is where the supply curve intersects, and I'm going to underemphasize that, 
is right here at this particular level. So that's going to be PN, the market price. Now, the thing that the demand curve is actually telling us, which is somewhat interesting, is that all of the people who buy the product QM at the price PM are there because they're receiving some kind of a surplus as a result of those trades. They're actually improving themselves because they're giving money in exchange for this particular product. Now, we'd like to know how much welfare they're getting from their individual exchanges, and the demand curve actually is giving us some information about that. So for example, just as an, an illustration, this demand curve is telling us that somebody out there would be willing to pay this price, call it PH, this price to purchase, let's say, one unit of the good. Demand curve says we could, we could sell one unit of the good even at a really ridiculously high price maybe. You know, maybe this is a pound of coffee, and a pound of coffee normally goes for, I don't know, $10 or something. You know, maybe there's one person out there that would pay $500 for a pound of coffee under some circumstances. And this demand curve is telling us there's somebody out there maybe like that. But that person didn't buy the coffee at $500 or $100 or whatever. They paid $10, just like everybody else in a market. But their willingness to pay that $500 is a willingness or an, a, a measurement. We can use that as a measurement of how much happiness they're actually achieving as a result of purchasing the product at the price of $10. Right? And it's going to be given by an area that's one unit in horizontal distance and this distance, pH minus pm in vertical distance. So in other words, we can carve out an area between the price in the market, PM, and the demand curve, and note that there's somebody who's getting this much surplus value, I call it, consumer surplus value from that first unit. And then there's somebody else out there who maybe will buy the product at a little bit lower price, and somebody else again at an even lower price, and so forth and so on, until we get to the last person who enters the market who's just willing to pay PM for one unit of the good and actually pays PM. What that means is that we can evaluate and measure now, using a demand curve, all of the surplus value that's accruing to all of the different, maybe millions of consumers in that market by simply measuring all of these little individual rectangles. And those rectangles are going to converge to the area of the demand curve, the price, and the vertical axis. So this, this, this area right here is what we're going to use to refer to market consumer surplus. Market consumer surplus is the area between the demand curve, the price in the marketplace, and the vertical axis. If the demand curve is linear, then we've got a nice triangular area that we can use to assess how much surplus is accruing. And in a sense, what it is, is it's saying Smith and Jones come together, Jones is the consumer, Jones is walking away with an improvement in utility by some amount. That's what we're measuring here in dollar terms, in terms of Jones's surplus. Maybe Jones is this person right here getting this much surplus as a result of the trade at the price PM. Okay? So that's how we're going to measure welfare accruing to consumers, total surplus value across all of the consumers in a market when we have a demand curve specified. All right? Good. Next, producer surplus. Take the quantity and price, draw a supply curve, S. Mark off a price where demand intersects it, and or emphasize the demand side of things. Let's get a market price, PM, and a quantity, QM. M for the market price. I don't know why I'm calling it that. I'll just say. Can you slide it up a little bit? Sorry. Yeah, now, as you might guess, just from analogy, uh, producer surplus is going to turn out to be this area right here. It's the area between the price that prevails in the market, the supply curve, and the vertical axis. And it's going to correspond, and I'm going to give you the long step-by-step -step de definition here. You can read a little bit about it in the notes. But producer surplus is going to be equal to total profit in the industry plus total fixed costs in production. Fixed costs. 
Fixed costs are the costs which you have to incur even if you produce zero output of a particular product. It's things like the rental space on the office that you're using for the year, the factory space, the things that you've had to put into place even to get off the ground and produce um, one unit of the good. And if you close down, you still have to pay the rent, you still have to pay the phone bill, you still have certain electricity charges. There's certain things you just have to incur, and you can't get away with that uh, from them for a period of time. All right, don't worry too much about that. What I want us to recognize is that producer surface sur uh, surplus is analogous or a pretty close proxy to profitability in the industry. All right, so we can think of producer surplus as a measure of profit. And as such, if we imagine that firms are trying to maximize their profitability or at least achieve more profit, having more profit is good for them, having less profit is bad for them. And it's going to be given by the area, again, between the price that prevails in the market and the supply curve. Now, questions, thoughts? Let's suppose we have a nice upward sloping supply curve and a downward sloping demand curve and a market price and quantity that looks something like this. I'm often going to want to measure the values of these things in a conceptual way. That is, I mean, I could put numbers here. I could say this is 600 units, and this is 100, the price, and this is, um, I don't know, 800. Or I could put numbers there, and then we could calculate the areas of all of these things. But a more likely way is for me to just mark off areas, like A and B. And we're going to let A represent the area of whatever shape it happens to be sitting in. So it's sitting in this triangular shape, so A is meant to represent the area of that tri triangle. B is meant to represent the area of this triangle. And if I were to say, what is consumer surplus in the diagram on the left, you would say it's equal to A. And if I were to ask, what is producer surplus on the diagram on the left, you would say it's equal to B. And if I said, what is market welfare? That is, what is the total surplus value that's accruing to everybody in the market by virtue of sales of QM at the price PM? You would say A plus B total surplus value accruing to all the groups as measured in the marketplace. Now, uh, how do we measure surplus? What, uh, what uh, units do we measure it in? Did I mention it? It's an area on the graph. And notice that on the horizontal axis, we're measuring quantity, which has been pounds, let's say. And on the vertical axis, we're measuring prices, which are in dollars per pound, let's say then an area on the graph is like an area of any rectangular shape, right? Would be dollars per pound times pounds. Multiply those together, what do we end up with? Dollars. We end up with dollars. So consumer surplus is measured in dollars. It's a total amount of like extra dollars that people are not having to pay, but which they would be willing to pay in order to acquire the certain goods. And thus, it's a measurement in dollar terms of the happiness they're getting on purchases of, of those products. While profits are measured in dollar terms. How much is the total profits in dollars that are accruing to the firms? So we measure market welfare by the summation of kind of an imaginary figure. The surplus accruing to consumers is not actually realized, but it gives us a dollar way of representing how much happiness is accruing to them. And it allows us to compare it with profits, also measured in dollars, and give us a market welfare analysis or uh, depiction of A plus B here. OK? Take a look at this diagram. All right, now, I've got a bunch of stuff up there. So let me explain. We've got a supply and demand curve for a particular product. The product, what it is, doesn't really matter. I often will use the product coffee just to have something to talk about. So maybe we're talking about the quantity of coffee in pounds measured along the horizontal axis in a marketplace in a particular country. On the vertical axis, we've got the price of coffee in dollars per pound. Now, we've got a supply curve for coffee, which is the supply by the domestic producers, many of them, competing against each other and supplying coffee to the domestic marketplace. The demand curve is the demand by all of the different consumers in the marketplace, many, many, many of them, who are coming to the market each day and purchasing coffee. 
Now, the intersection of supply and demand is where we normally focus our attention for the equilibrium in an economy. But in this context now, that's going to be a very particular kind of equilibrium that will arise only under the circumstance of AUT. And AUT is a word that refers to autarky. Autarky is a state in which a country is not open to international trade with others in the rest of the world. It's closed off. It's isolated. It's an autarky, we say. So Q, ought, and P, ought, here and here, correspond to the price and quantity that would prevail in this particular market if the country did not trade with the rest of the world. If I said, suppose this country is an autarky, or this market is an autarky, what would be the total amount of consumer surplus that would accrue to consumers in the marketplace in autarky? You would say, area between the demand curve and the price, that's going to be ABC. And you would, I would ask you, what is the total amount of profits that accrue to the firms in autarky? And you would say, let's see, F and G. And if I ask, what is the total market welfare in autarky? You'd add them all up, A, B, C, F, and G. Now you'll notice there's some extra areas there, and sometimes you'll find that sometimes those extra areas are needed, and sometimes they're not needed. And I'll do that just to kind of mess you up, make sure that you know what it is you're looking for. I'll also change the letters. So sometimes I'll have A, B, C, D, and sometimes I'll have capital letters, and sometimes I'll order them in different ways. So you can't memorize the welfare of consumers is always A, B, C. It just, that won't work. So learn the method you have to use and be able to apply it to different looking diagrams. Now, here's the story we're going to ask. We're going to ask, what if this country that starts out in autarky decides to open up to international trade? And let's imagine that this is a small country, cannot influence the price in any way, so even if it opens up to trade and starts selling products or buying products from the world, it's too small of a participant to really affect what's going on in the world market. So, you know, we think of a country like, I don't know, Jamaica or something, starting to sell um, coffee. Now, maybe Jamaica has some influence, oh, probably not over the coffee market, because so much is produced in Brazil and in Colombia and elsewhere that Jamaica is just not going to, through their own supply and demand, going to affect very much in the world market. You think Jamaica's too big? We can go to Monaco and pick an even smaller country. Can't influence what's going on in the world. All right, so that's this country can't influence what's going on in the world. Now suppose they open up to trade and they see that the world price, the price prevailing in the world, is higher than the autarky price that prevails in this country. So what if PW, the world price, is greater than P aught? Well, that's going to inspire some changes in behavior on the part of firms and consumers in this particular market. What's going to motivate trade in this context is going to be producers. Because producers are suddenly, once we kind of magically open up trade to other countries in the world, they're going to see that world price of PW, and they're going to recognize that they could sell their product at a higher price and thus earn more profits, presumably, if they could sell abroad. So producers at, in this country are going to be motivated because they're motivated to make more money to move their product and sell it in the international market. So they're going to start shifting sales abroad all right, to take advantage of that higher price. But when they start selling more abroad, they're selling less at home, right? And because they're selling less at home, there's less supply, but the same amount of demand as before at the original price. And that's going to mean price is going to start to get bid up. There's going to be excess demand for the product at home because the producers are starting to sell it at an advantage abroad. <coughs> and that's going to start to push the domestic price upward. What we'd expect to happen then, because of competition, both at home and abroad, is that the domestic price is going to rise up to the world price. And everybody in the world is going to face the same price now with PW. So, open up to trade. Autarky price is immaterial now because we're not autarkic. We can trade as much as we want at the world price. The price instantaneously will move up to PW. Now, we're imposing one other easy or simplifying assumption here, and that is that there's no costs of transportation, no barriers to trade, no tariffs or taxes at the border, 
there are no impediments whatsoever. So we're really talking about free and costless trade with the world, and we're making that assumption mostly to keep it simple. All right, well, what happens when we open up to trade then and the price goes up to PW? Well, producers are going to be inspired because they can get a higher price to shift up their supply along the supply curve and increase their quantity <coughs> supplied from QR up to SFT. SFT is the new free trade level of supply by the domestic producers. They're inspired to produce more because of the higher price. Now, consumers, because they face a higher price at home too, PW is higher than PR, they're going to reduce their quantity consumed from QF, QR down to to DFT. So demand is going to go down domestically. And that means we're going to end up with excess supply of the product, it seems, in the home market. Supply is going to be greater than the demand domestically. So what happens to the excess? It goes abroad. It gets sold in the international market. So the firms are going to export EX this distance between SFT and DFT. And that's the final result of opening up to trade and facing a higher price. Exports are going to occur. Domestic price is going to go up to the world price. Domestic demand is going to fall. <coughs> now, you probably have paid enough attention to policy discussions in the past, and you probably have heard that exports by a country are a good thing. We try to promote exports. They think exports are good. We need to export more. We need foreign countries to lower their barriers so we can export more. Why? Because exports are good. It's always good. We love to have exports. When President Obama became president, we were in the midst of a pretty serious recession. And one of the initiatives he put into place at that time, about in 2009 or so, was called the National Export Initiative. And he said, what we have to do is we have to set a goal. We're going to set a goal of more exports. In fact, we're going to set a very um, optimistic goal. We're going to try to double our exports by 2014. Absolutely double them. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to expand production. We want to do good things. We want the economy to thrive. And we actually did achieve about that same doubling of exports by 2014 or so. All right, now, let's see. In the context of this very simple model, we can ask, are exports a good thing? Well, exports are going to inspire an increase in the price domestically. We can take a look at what happens to the groups that are involved in this particular market domestically. And the first question we're going to ask is what happens to consumers as a result of us exporting this product abroad? To answer that question, we start by asking what is their surplus before the exports occurred? And the answer we already said was ABC. Now that the price has gone up, what is their total quantity demanded in the market? Quantity demanded at the world price is going to be DFT. What's the price they face? It's going to be PW. So what's the consumer surplus they're accruing to them now? A. But what I want to do is I want to do delta CS. Delta means change in. So what is the change in consumer surplus as a result of opening up to trade? Is it positive or negative, first of all? Negative. It's going to be negative. And how much negative? B and C. So we can put minus parentheses B plus C. Interesting thing. As a result of opening up and having more exports to the world market, and because we're not supplying the product in as great of an abundance here at home, prices go up domestically and consumers get hurt. Some people lose as a result of an export initiative, in other words. And it's going to be the consumers of this particular product. They'll lose B and C. What about producers, though? We can calculate the change in producer surplus that will arise because of the opening up to exports. What is it? Positive BC. The original area of producer surplus in, in autarky was F and G. But now, production has increased to SFT. They're supplying all of this, some domestically this much, some exported that much. And total surplus, or profits accruing to the firms in the industry, is going to be B, C, D, E, F, and G. The change is a positive B plus C plus F plus G, right? I'm sorry. B, C, I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm not looking at the graph when I'm writing it. B, C, D, and E. <coughs> Producers benefit. They get more profits. Oh, and by the way, an important thing that's kind of hidden here, 
is that because they're increasing supply from QR up to SFT, what do they need in order to expand production? More people. That means more workers. That means there's going to be an expansion of employment in this particular industry because we're exporting more to the world market and we're producing more. So exports are going to create jobs. We're going to get more jobs in the industry, and that's going to be a good thing. The firms are going to make more profits. That's a good thing. Now, we might ask, what's the total effect as a result of this exports to the world market? We can do a change in market welfare, or national welfare, sometimes I call it, by adding up the effects on consumers and producers. And we can see pretty quickly that we've got a minus B on the first line and a plus B on the second, so those are going to cancel out. We've got a minus C and a plus C. Those are going to cancel out. We're going to be left with a big D plus E. Those are both positive, meaning that the net effect of opening up to exports to the world market is indeed positive. The gains exceed the losses, the increased profitability, and the extra jobs that are created in the industry are going to more than offset the losses to consumers who have to pay a higher price for these exported goods at home. And we would say there's an improvement in economic efficiency in the market because of trade. So if you ask economists in general, is trade a good thing from the aggregate perspective? <coughs> They'd say, yeah, the competitive market, sure, it's going to be a good thing. But don't forget that there are losses to be made, that some people are not going to be better off as a result of this opening up to trade and exporting more. And if you're just a consumer of this good and you have no connection to the industry, you have no stocks in that industry, you don't have any friends or any relatives working in that industry, well, you're not going to enjoy any of the benefits from that industry. You're just going to have to pay the higher prices for the goods that are being exported. And you will be worse off as a result of that. So winners and losers, but the net effect is positive. <coughs> Okay. Questions? Thoughts? Let's do another example. Now we're going to open up the trade, but we're going to find that the world price is not greater than the autarky price. What if we open up in another market and the world price is less than the autarky price. <clears throat> so this is going to be if PW is less than P aught in a market, and this would have to be a different market. You can't simultaneously have a higher price and a lower price in the same market. So this has got to be some other product. And what would happen if we have a lower price for the product? Now, the lower price is going to inspire trade by virtue of consumer behavior now. Because consumers are going to be able to say, hey, I could stay at home for the moment and buy this price, this product at price P off. Or I could buy the product on Amazon or something, um, and I can purchase the product abroad at a much lower price. And by the way, they're offering no shipping charges this week, so it doesn't even cost me anything. So I just engage with the trader abroad, I buy the product abroad, I ship it home, and I'm able to buy the product at a lower price. Now, as soon as I start doing that and others start to do that, because they can find these lower prices abroad, domestic firms are going to have to respond to the competition. And the way they're going to have to respond is, well, they can't sell their product at P-Oct anymore. Every consumer can easily access the products abroad and buy them cheaply. So therefore, there's going to be less demand for the products at home, and that's going to put <coughs> the price of the products at home downward. So domestic producers are going to drop their price at home in order to become competitive with the international market. And what that means in the end is that the price in the market entirely is going to be dropped to PW when you open up to trade and face that world price. Being a small country, that means if you open up to trade, you take the price of the world as given to you, and you then go ahead and make your decisions of what to produce and consume based on that. So here's the effect. Q aught and P aught are the original prices, but as a result of opening up to trade, um, demand is going to increase to DFT. And supply is going to decrease to SFT. And the difference between the two, DFT minus SFT, is going to be equal to the amount of imports that will arise in free trade. IMFT for imports in free trade. I'll make that a mark there. So that distance. So what's 
what's going to happen if we open up and we face a lower world price? We're going to be importing the product and we're going to get lower prices for the product at home. All right, now we could kind of assess what is the general discussion about imports and what influence it has upon our domestic economy. And I would argue that it seems like most policymakers and most policy discussions tends to focus on the kind of following evaluation. Exports were good, we knew that, and it turned out to be good. But imports, well, those are often not viewed as very positive for the economy, right? And we're hearing and we have heard in the presidential discussions that you know we're importing too many cheap products from abroad, from Mexico, from China, and we want to block, block those because it's having a detrimental effect upon people within our economy. Let's see if that's true, according to this very simple model. All right, well, what's going to happen? Well, we can assess what the impact is going to be on the consumer and the producer groups in this particular industry. So first of all, let's take a look at consumers. And we can calculate the changes in well-being to consumers by looking at the change in consumer surplus. That's our measure of well-being accruing to people in the marketplace. Now, well-being originally was given by area A for consumers, right? But now the price has fallen to PW and consumption has increased to DFT. So what's the change in consumer surplus? It's going to be a positive B plus C plus D. Consumers are better off as a result of the lower prices and the increased quantities that they can consume of this product. So that's the first thing to note. Imports actually have some beneficial effects. But the second thing we can note is what happens to producer surplus? It's going to go down. Producers are cutting back their production. The price they're receiving is lower. And therefore, the change in producer surplus, original producer surplus was B and E. Now it's just E. So what's the change? Minus B. There's a loss in profitability to the industry of area B. Producers are worse off. Oh, and by the way, there's a drop in the quantity produced, right, in the industry. A drop in the quantity produced means what has to have happened on the inside. Lost jobs. We're firing workers, laying them off, sending them home not employing as many. So the employment in the industry is definitely going down as a result of the competition from abroad. But when we measure it in terms of the well-being occurring to the producers and the owners of those individual firms, we're going to get that loss of minus B. Now we can calculate the change in market welfare. Change in market welfare is the sum of these two. <coughs> Bs are going to cancel out because I got a plus and a minus. I'm going to be left in the end with a C plus D. Or in other words, what our simple market analysis would suggest to us is that the benefits to consumers of facing lower prices, paying less for them, is going to overwhelm or outweigh the losses that are going to accrue to producers in the form of lower profits, leading us to a net benefit, an aggregate benefit, an increase in economic efficiency as a result of opening up to trade and becoming an importer. If we think of things from the aggregate perspective or from an economic efficiency perspective, then the conclusion we should reach is not exports good, import bad. But from an aggregate perspective, we should conclude imports good, exports good. Both are good. But we should also recognize that there will be some groups who might be vocal about in opposition to these particular changes. And in particular, on the import side, it's going to be producers and the workers in those particular industries who are going to say, wait a minute, I don't see that free trade is such a great idea because aren't I losing my job? And isn't the industry losing profitability? And isn't the industry contracting? And isn't all of that a bad thing for our economy? The answer would be yes, 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 yes. But less of a bad than all of the positive benefits that are accruing to all of the consumers who are facing lower prices and enjoying those benefits of cheaper products from abroad. So imports <coughs> still become good from the aggregate perspective. Now there's one last thing that's worth highlighting here. We're going to come back to this in the last, probably, lecture of the class. You know, we might say, well, we're ignoring the workers. What about the workers who are losing their jobs here? Isn't that a bad thing? And how come we're not really factoring that in? We're really only measuring the losses to the owners of the firms in terms of their lost profitability. 
So what about the workers and shouldn't we be concerned about that? The answer is twofold. The answer is yes and no. And it depends on the assumptions of what's going on in the background and how we deal with that. So for the moment, we're going to make the optimistic assumption. The optimistic assumption is that these workers who lose their jobs in this particular industry are working in a competitive industry. A competitive labor market means, yes, you might lose your job in this particular sector, but that doesn't mean you lose your job forever permanently. It just means you're not going to work in this particular industry anymore. And you're going to have to go search for another job somewhere else. And if the markets are competitive everywhere, then you're actually going to be able to earn more money, maybe not more money, but you'll earn money equal to what you got before. You'll get a job somewhere else, because if the jobs aren't there, the wages are going to adjust in order to equalize supply and demand in the labor market. So in the background of this story, when we say that there is a net benefit to the market because of opening up to trade, and we ask what's happened to those workers who lose their jobs, our answer really is in terms of the model, that it's OK because they found a job somewhere else. As long as workers are movable, as long as they can get a job in some other industry quickly and easily enough, then this conclusion is going to be valid. But to the extent that they can't find a job in another industry, then we're going to have to add in some additional costs of adjustment and think about reevaluating this outcome a little bit later when we'll do that in the last class. Okay, so we're going to deal with that particular issue in a regulated way sometime later. Okay, good. Last thing we want to do. Now, we're going to tell a different story. We're going to begin with the price PW, the world price. And we're going to imagine that the country begins with free trade and is an importer of this particular product. So the original free trade level of imports is DFT minus SFT, and the original price in the market is PW. So now we're not comparing autarky with free trade. We're beginning with free trade, and here's what we're going to do. Let's imagine that a tariff is imposed. And a tariff is a tax at the border. Remember that there's two ways in which you can implement a tax. You can do an ad valorem tax, a percentage of value, or you can do a specific tax, dollar charge per unit of imports. Let's do a dollar charge, and let's imagine that it's T dollars per pound is the tariff that's being implemented. Now, T is going to correspond to this vertical distance right here. And here's what's going to happen in an open, small economy that's open to international trade. The price that prevails in the market with the tariff in place is going to be equal to whatever is the free trade price plus the tariff. Just tack that tax on top of the free trade price, and that's going to turn out to be the new internal price in your market if you put a tax at the border in place. So PT, the price with the tariff in place, is going to be equal to the free trade price that prevailed before plus the tariff rate. So if the price was, say, $10 a pound and the tariff is $2 per pound, then the new price internally is going to be your $12 per pound. Now there's a bunch of adjustments that kind of take place to get you there. Because what's going to happen is, remember, you're only taxing with a customs duty like this, you're only taxing the imported good. You're not taxing the domestically produced good at all. So the domestic producers don't face a higher cost of getting the product into the internal market because they're already there. But the foreign producers have to pay this tax at the border. So in the adjustment process, what's going to happen is kind of the, domestic, the foreign product price is going to rise up by the tax because they have to cover their extra costs, while the domestic price is going to stay low for a little while. But because one product, which looks exactly like the domestic product, is much higher in price, <clears throat> what's going to happen is the consumers are going to stop buying this expensive good, and they're all going to want to buy this good, leading to an extra demand for this lower price domestic good. But that excess demand and profit-seeking behavior on the part of these firms is going to inspire them to raise up their price, because they can make more money by doing so. And they're going to be inspired to raise up their price until it becomes just equal to the price plus the tariff. And that's why both domestic products and foreign imported products are all going to end up in a competitive market charging the same price for the product. And that price is going to be PFT plus T. 
Now, we ask, what happens then when a tariff is put into place in this context? The effect of the tariff is to raise up the price, so the price goes from PFT to PT. It goes up. And it reduces the quantity of imports. I'm sorry. Reduces imports. Right? So imports originally were DFT minus SFT, this distance here. Now imports have fallen to the distance between demand and supply, which is now DT minus ST. So the effect of the tax is going to be to raise up the domestic price by the full amount of the tax in a small country case and reduce the quantity of imports. If you put a bigger tax into place, you know, let's say I put a tax that raised the domestic price all the way up to here. Big tax. Call it T2. If I raise the tax all the way up to there and the new price became that, well, look at what happens to imports. It disappears. So with a big enough tax, you can eliminate trade entirely in that particular product. And you can push yourself back to autarky in that product. That tax, by the way, T2 is what we would call a prohibitive tariff. H-I-P-I-T-I-V. Prohibitive tariff. Eliminates trade. Is to talk about what happens if a small country puts a tariff into place. Now, a tariff is a tax at the border, and we're imagining here that the country puts into place a specific tariff. That means a dollar charge per unit of the good being imported. The alternative way of implementing a tariff is what? Ad valorem. Ad valorem tariff. That's a percentage tax on the uh, value of the good that's being imported. Both of them will have the same nature of effect, but they'll look a little bit different on the graph, and the specific tariff is just easier to do. Now what happens is that the price after the tariff within the domestic country is actually going to rise up by the full amount of the tariff. So you take the free trade price, add on the tax, whatever charge it is, and the sum total of the price plus the tax is going to be what the new price will prevail in the small importing country that places a tariff on imported goods. All right, next. What are the welfare effects of this? Let's do it real quick. The change in consumer surplus is going to be equal to uh, the area between the original price, PW, the new price, PT, and the demand curve. And that's going to mean an area minus A plus B plus C plus D in parentheses, minuses for all of them, a reduction in consumer surplus by the area ABCD. Producer surplus is the area between the price before, the price after, and the supply curve. That's going to be area A, and it's a plus A. Producers gain more profit, they expand their production, they hire more workers, everything looks good in the industry that's being protected. And lastly, we calculate the change in government revenue. The revenue effect is going to be the tax T times the quantity of imports, which is going to be DT minus ST. And that, in turn, is going to be equal to area plus C on the graph. Got it there? Yes. Add them all up to get the change in national welfare or market welfare as a result of the tariff, and we're going to get the following. The A's cancel, the C's cancel, and we're going to be left with minus B minus D. These are called deadweight losses in total. And it's a representation of the loss of economic efficiency that arises because of the tariff being put into place upsetting the free market equilibrium, if you will. Now, I want to highlight and kind of allude to some, to some similarities. We sometimes call area B a, what do we call it? We call it a production efficiency loss. We sometimes call area D, which is the little triangle that shows up next to the demand curve, a consumption efficiency loss. And we put the two together, they're called deadweight losses, but they're the total efficiency losses that are arising because of the tariff being put into place. Now, the production efficiency loss. Production efficiency is kind of, it's kind of, well, let me go back to the other one. 
consumption efficiency. So consumption efficiency is what we saw arise when Smith and Jones came together and traded apples and oranges that they were endowed with at the beginning. Remember the story, Smith has 10 oranges, Jones has 10 apples. They come together and trade with each other. And as a result of just rearranging who gets to consume what, they were able to get to a higher level of utility onto a higher indifference curve, right? All right, now what's happening there is there's no increase in production, but there is an increase in well-being in the economy because of the rearrangement of consumption. That is what we would call an increase in consumption efficiency. We're not producing anything more, we're just rearranging who gets to consume what, and by re rearranging it appropriately, we're able to increase the welfare of both of the participants combined. When we put the tariff into place, we have a loss of consumption efficiency. We're not consuming the appropriate goods in some sense. And area D is giving us a measurement in dollar terms of that loss of efficiency that's arising in the economy. So part of the reason we're messing things up, if you will, with the tariff is because we're rearranging who gets to consume what, and that's generating a loss of consumption efficiency. Now, the second area, B, it's not directly related, but it's kind of like this. Production efficiency is like what we got when Smith and Jones specialized in their comparative advantage goods and were able to produce more apples and more oranges because of that. That led to an increase in overall output with the same amount of resources being applied. That's an increase in production efficiency. Increases in productivity overall for the economy. Now, when we put the tariff into place, We've got a production efficiency loss. That's kind of like we're not producing as effectively as we did before. We've got fewer goods to go around than we did before. Even though these firms are producing more, we're actually generating an efficiency loss because of the inappropriateness in the sense of production by not consuming or produce, producing at the most efficient place, which is abroad. Okay, so these two things correspond to the the opposite of the gains that we were showing in the Ricardian model and in the pure exchange model. It also tells us that tariffs reduce overall economic welfare and actually make a country that's putting the tariff into place overall worse off than they would be if they had allowed free trade to prevail and just kept the price at the price PW. And this is one of the stronger arguments to be made in favor of trade liberalization or free trade agreements being formed. Most economists accept the fact that by moving to freer trade and engaging in trade liberalization, we will actually be able to improve efficiency in the world economy and in our own economy and actually generate welfare improvements overall. But we always should recognize that one of the resistances to that movement is groups that recognize that they're likely to be losers as a result of the movement to free trade. And they are the ones who resist that trade liberalization and will make arguments that trade liberalization has failed us, trade liberalization is bad for the country, we should step away from our trade agreements in some ways. The calls for that now are focusing attention on just one aspect of the losses because of trade liberalization, not looking at the big picture. All right, now what we're going to do, we're going to talk about a slightly different set of assumptions. We're going to change the assumption of a small country opening up to international trade, and we're going to talk about a large country instead. Now, a large country is large by virtue of the fact that it can influence international prices through its behavior. And I'm going to show you kind of how that works. As such, it's going to be more indicative of countries like the United States or like China or like the European Union which are very, very large economies, and through their trade policies, they can actually influence what prices prevail elsewhere by changing the supply and demand with those countries. Now, to cut to the chase, let me give you the conclusion we're going to show here. We're going to show that actually when a country is large in international markets, free trade turns out not to be the best policy. And in fact, some small level of protectionism, some tariff at the border, will actually raise up the welfare of the large importing country above what could be obtained in free trade. So while you might think that most economists say that free trade is good for everybody or for all countries in all circumstances, that's actually not what trade theory tells us. 
It tells us that free trade is not the best policy in all circumstances. It depends on the circumstances. Free trade is the best policy when you are a small country in international markets. Although, we'll come up with some complaints about that as well and some criticisms of that in the last couple of lectures, last lecture. All right, now, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to draw a couple of diagrams. I'm going to do this freehand now. I'm going to draw two diagrams side by side. And each of these is going to be a supply and demand curve. So let's imagine that we've got the market for coffee. And we have two countries, the U.S. and Brazil. On the left-hand side, it's going to be the coffee market for the United States. We've got the price and quantity of coffee marked off on the axes. On the right-hand side, we've got the price and quantity of coffee in Brazil. We're going to imagine that we can represent the consumers and producers in each of these markets with supply and demand curves. But we're going to do it in a slightly different way so that we can guarantee the trade is going to take place between these two economies. Oh, by the way, we're going to imagine that there are only two countries in the world, the U.S. and Brazil. There's nobody else. All right, now, I'm going to draw a supply and demand curve. Don't do this yet until I get it down. I'm going to draw a supply and demand curve in the U.S., and I'm going to make sure that the intersection is way up high on the graph like that. That's going to give me a lot more room to work with, and it's going to guarantee that the U.S. is an importing country, which is what I want to have happen. So there's the supply curve and the demand curve, respectively. Now, if I just looked at this graph and said, what's the equilibrium price and quantity, you might be tempted to say, well, that's going to be where supply is equal to demand, and that's going to generate a price. But the price that that gives me is what we call the autarky price, right? It's the price that would prevail if the U.S. isn't open to international trade and is supplying and demanding the products at home exclusively. That's not going to be our focal point here. Now, Brazil has consumers and producers of coffee as well. But we're going to draw Brazil's diagram such that the intersection of supply and demand is way down low on the graph, like this. So this is Brazil's demand curve. I might make a DB to indicate Brazil, SB for Brazil, DUS for the US, SUS for the US supply. And that way I can distinguish the two if I need to. Now, Brazil's intersection of supply and demand generates a price, but it as well is the autarky price that would prevail in Brazil if Brazil did not trade with anybody. So PB aught is the Brazil's autarky price. PUS aught is the US autarky price. I have drawn this purposely for the prices in autarky to be different from each other. Because if they are different from each other, we might expect the two countries that are isolated from each other for the moment, who are allowed to come together and trade with each other, might actually begin to engage in trade. And they would engage in trade for the following reasons, we would say. If the autarky price in Brazil is lower and the price in the U.S. is higher, then bringing the two markets together and assuming that there's no transportation costs or impediments at the border for the moment, then what would happen is Brazilian producers would want to take advantage of the higher prices that prevail in the U.S. and would begin to export or ship their product over to the U.S. market. As a result of that, extra supply in the U.S. market would start to push the price in the U.S. downward. But at the same time, because Brazil producers are not supplying as much to the Brazilian market, there's lower supply available to consume in the, in the Brazilian market. So less supply in Brazil is going to push the price in Brazil up. So as the product starts to move from Brazil to the U.S. market, the U.S. price is going to come down, the Brazilian price is going to come up, and they're going to meet somewhere in between, not necessarily right in the middle, but not equally up and down, but somewhere in between such that total supply of coffee is equal to total demand for coffee, or where the amount that Brazil wishes to export is exactly equal to the amount that the U.S. wishes to import. The conditions are going to look like this. In the end, once we get to a new... Uh, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. Not quite there. Not quite there. Sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so the prices are going to come together 
such that the amount that Brazil exports is equal to the amount that the U.S. imports. Now, we want to find one price where that's going to be true. So just like, let's, uh, let's, just, uh, let's just eyeball this. And notice, for example, that if I picked a price given by the line that uh, represents the paper that I'm covering up the uh, graph with, then you can look at the difference between the two. This is demand in the U.S., this is supply in the U.S. at that price. This is supply in Brazil, this is the demand in Brazil at that price. And we could ask, if that, is it at that price, is it such that Brazil exports the same amount that the U.S. wishes to import? The answer is no. Brazil would want to export more than the U.S. would be willing to import at that particular price. So that's not the free trade price. But notice what happens as we lower the price. Brazil's difference between supply and demand falls, while the U.S.'s difference increases until we get to a point that looks about like that, right? And at that, imports by the U.S. would be about exactly equal to exports by Brazil. Look, if we go too far, we get to a point like this. Now Brazil would wish to export this much, but the U.S. would wish to import that much. They're not equal to each other. So to find the free trade price, we're just going to find a point along here, a price line, that equalizes the distance between these two. Looks like it's about, about there, right? I'm going to avoid drawing the lines down to the axis, but this would be the supply in Brazil, this distance. This would be demand in Brazil. And the difference between the two would be excess supply by Brazil, and that difference would be the amount that Brazil wishes to export to the U.S. market. The difference here, this is demand in the U.S., this is supply. Looks a little bit bigger to me, but that's okay. That difference is the amount of imports that the U.S. would undertake from Brazil. And if we got it right, the right price, then the amount that Brazil exports should be equal to the amount that the U.S. imports. And we've got what would now be called a free trade equilibrium, and I could mark this off as the free trade price that would prevail in the marketplace. Now, this is not actually what we want to do. This is just getting us to the starting point. Because what we want to analyze here is what happens if a tariff is put into place by the importing country in this particular scenario. So we want to ask, what are the effects of a tariff when a large country puts a tariff on imported goods? Now, the importing country in this particular example is the United States. So we're going to ask the question, what happens if the U.S. were to put a tariff on imports of a product from Brazil? What would happen to the prices in the two countries? Now, here things work a little bit differently than they did in the small country case. But let's start out with the small country assumption and see how it's going to change just a little bit. First of all, the U.S. is importing this much coffee. Let's say they put a tax into place. Let's say the price is, I like to use nice round numbers, so let's say the price is $10 per pound of coffee. And that's the equilibrium world price, free trade price between the two countries. But let's suppose that the U.S. decides to put a tax into place of $2 per, uh, per pound of coffee. $2 per pound. Now, in a small country case, we said what would happen domestically is that the price would rise for the imported good to $12. And that domestic producers would come along and increase their supply to match the $12. <coughs> but here's how things are going to change a little bit. When the imported good rises up in price by, 12, uh, by two extra dollars, the Brazilians are going to start to charge Americans $12 for their coffee because they need to in order to cover their costs of producing this. All right, but domestic producers might originally keep their price at $10. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to lead U.S. consumers to walk into the market and see Brazilian coffee at $12, U.S. coffee at $10. And we make the assumption in this model for simplicity that all the coffee is homogeneous. It's all exactly the same. So consumers would not see any difference between Brazilian and American coffee. Seeing the American coffee is cheaper, they would buy that first. And only after that's depleted would they finally start to grudgingly purchase the $12 coffee that's left over. 
Now, what that means is that individuals are going to stream towards the American coffee and increase their demand astoundingly because they want to be the first in line and they want to get that $10 coffee. The demand for American coffee is going to be very high in the aftermath of the tariff. And if U.S. firms respond accordingly because they're interested in making money, they're going to raise up their price because of that excess demand for their product. So the U.S. price of coffee is going to rise up, even though their costs haven't changed at all. And that's actually going to turn out to be something that benefits them. Now, the Brazilians are going to realize they can't sell as much coffee as they did before because the price has been pushed up to $12. And they're going to respond in part by pulling some of that coffee back to their own home market because it's the only other place they can go with it. We'll assume they don't dump it in the ocean. And there is no other co uh, country to sell it to, so in our model, so they're going to bring it back home. Now, here's where the large country assumption comes in. When Brazil pulls some of their coffee back and stops exporting as much to the U.S. market, the increase in supply back in Brazil is sufficient enough to push the price in Brazil downward. So extra supply in Brazil pushes the price down rather than keeping it at the same level. If the U.S. were a small country, its imports or restriction on imports would not affect Brazil because they wouldn't notice it. But because the U.S. is now a large country, the U.S. tariff pushes enough coffee back to Brazil to affect the price in Brazil in the downward direction. So now here's what we have happening. U.S. price gets pushed up to $12 originally by Brazilian producers and $10 for U.S. producers. But because of the competition in the market, U.S. price is going to start to rise up closer to the 12. Brazilians are going to pull some of the coffee back to Brazil over here, and because of the extra supply, the Brazilian price is going to start to fall. As a result of that, because the price at home falls, they add on the $2, and the price they can charge for their American coffee is going to fall a little bit too. So while Brazilian coffee rises up to $12 at first and the U.S. coffee starts to rise, they're going to end up meeting somewhere in the middle, like, say, $11.50 or something, while the Brazilian price is going to get pushed down below the $10 per pound. In the end, here's number one that I wanted to draw up here. In the end, the following is going to be true. The new price that prevails in the U.S. with the tariff in place, I'm going to call it PUST. After the tariff of T is put into place, there's going to be a new U.S. price. I don't know what it is yet. I'm going to call it PUST. That's going to be equal to the new price that's going to prevail in Brazil after the U.S. tariff gets put into place. I'm going to call that PBT. That's the $9.50 or something that's now being charged in Brazil. And the difference between these two is going to be the amount of the tariff. So we take the Brazilian price of, say, $9.50, add on the $2 tariff, and we're going to end up with the American price for coffee, which is going to be the $11.50. So now notice, if the U.S. were a small country with a $10 price and they put a $2 tariff into place, the U.S. price is going to rise up to $12, the Brazilian price is going to stay at $10. If the U.S. is a large country and puts a tariff in place of $2, the U.S. price is going to rise up to something less than $12, and the Brazilian price is going to fall. But the difference between the two is still going to be the $2. Got it? Now, that price change could be many. There are many things that could happen. U.S. price could draw, uh, rise up to 11.75. Brazilian price could drop to 9.75. Still a $2 difference. Or it could be 11.50 and 9.50. $2 difference. Or it could be $11 and $9. $2 difference. There's lots of prices that could arise that would satisfy the conditions we need for the directions of changes and the price differences. So which one will prevail? The answer to that is found in condition number two. When the U.S. price rises up, at the free trade price, the amount that the U.S. wishes to import is given by the difference between the dots right there, right? On the left-hand side. But if we raise up the U.S. price, the difference between supply and demand is going to fall. That means at a higher U.S. price, the amount the U.S. wishes to import will be lower, given by the difference here between supply and demand. Raise up the price, the difference falls. Okay, now Brazil, in free trade, is exporting the same amount as the U.S. is importing that distance. 
but Brazil's price is going to get pushed downward like this. And a result of the Brazilian price falling down, the amount that Brazil wishes to export, the difference between these two lines at a particular price is going to fall. So now, Brazil in the end is going to be responding to whatever price prevails in their own market, which is going to be lower now. The U.S. is going to respond to their new price, which is higher. And therefore, in the end, we have to find a price difference that's going to satisfy this condition. Imports into the U.S. at the price that prevails in the U.S. after the tariff, PUST, has got to be equal to exports by Brazil at the price that prevails in Brazil after the tariff. So the Brazilian price is going to fall and they're going to wish to export less. The U.S. price is going to rise and they're going to wish to import less. We've got to find a price difference that's exactly $2 and that equalizes exports and imports between the two countries because there's only two countries and it has to all balance. All right, how's that going to look? It's going to look something like this. Let's just raise up the price for the U.S. to something like this. Let's call it PTUS, T-U-S-T. Right there. At the price, PUST demand is going to be this. Let's call it D sub T in the U.S. Supply is going to be equal to S sub T in the U.S. And the difference between the two is going to be the amount of imports with the tariff in place. I'm going to call it IMT. Or alternatively, it's going to be this value right here. <coughs> imports in the U.S. at the price, the higher price that now prevails compared to free trade. Now, exports from Brazil have to be equal to this distance in the end. So what I can do is I can take that distance, carry it over here, and find a difference between supply and demand at a lower price for Brazil, such that supply by Brazil with the tariff in place, minus demand from Brazil with the tariff in place, is going to be equal to exports from Brazil with the tariff in place, and that exports has got to be equal to these imports. So I tried to draw this so that this distance is approximately or exactly the same as this distance here. U.S. price gets pushed up, Brazilian price gets pushed down. Equalizing imports and exports. But now, if I take the Brazilian price and carry it over to the U.S. graph over here, mark it off, PBT, now I've got this distance right here. The difference between the U.S. price and the Brazilian price from condition number one has to be exactly equal to the value of the tariff. So this arrow right here is $2. It's not sized properly. I apologize for that. Can you slide it over? Oh, sorry about that. It's still doesn't do it. Okay, so the U.S. price is up here. Brazilian price has moved over to this graph down here. The difference between the two has to be equal to the value of the tariff according to this condition. So that describes the new equilibrium we're going to have in both of the countries' markets as a result of the tariff that gets put into place by the U.S., which is a large importing country in this scenario. Okay. Now, what happens then? Tariff has similar effects in a small country and large country. A tariff is going to raise up the domestic price in both cases. But a tariff is going to raise up the domestic price by more in a small country case than a large country case. Two, a tariff is not going to have any effect upon the foreign price in a small country case, but it will push the foreign price down in the large country case. Okay, so you have an effect if you're a large country abroad. You don't have any effect if you're a small country. Three, because of the higher price at home, the importing country is going to import less. So you can lower your imports into the country by putting a tariff into place. That should be natural. If you tax something, you should do less of it. If you tax imports, you should end up importing less. That would make sense. All right, so those are the basic 
price and quantity effects that arise in the two countries as a result of the tariff being put into place by the large importing country. Notice, too, though, that if we put a bigger tariff into place, a, high, a larger tariff, instead of two, we put three or four or five dollars into place, then the U.S. price is going to keep bidding up, going up more and more and more. But there's a limit to how high the U.S. price can go. Because if the price in the U.S. rises up to this level right here, then we stop importing completely from Brazil. If the tariff pushes the U.S. price up to the autarky price, then it eliminates trade. And that's going to happen at any tariff that is greater than or equal to the U.S. autarky price minus the Brazilian autarky price, which is down here. So once you get a tariff that's equal to the difference between the autarky prices, you equal, either set that tariff or anything bigger than that, you're just going to drive the countries into autarky or no trade and they're going to revert back to their autarky prices. You can keep raising the tariff as much as you want beyond that. It's not going to affect anything that happens in the two markets. So it might be like that in tobacco imports into the U.S. We have a 350% tariff on tobacco imports. It's likely that that's prohibitive. We probably don't import any tobacco as a result of that. Now, we could raise the tariff up to 500% tomorrow. It would not have any effect upon the tobacco market because we weren't importing anything to begin with. All right, now, we want to assess. Question? If, I, if we suddenly raise the tariff on a good, would that be basically because of lobbying or change in industry? Lobbying is going to have an effect, because as we're going to see here, just like in the small country case, if you put the tariff into place, it's going to help a particular industry. All right, so that industry might be very much inclined to want to lobby for that particular policy, because it's going to help them directly. Okay, the losses are going to go to others. And we're going to look carefully at who the losers are going to be here, and think about what the overall ramifications of that will be. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Next step is we're going to do the welfare impacts of this particular tariff. Things are going to get a little messier now. You can believe it. All right, I'm going to need a couple of areas on the U.S. graph in order to assess the changes in welfare to consumers, producers, and government benefit recipients. Um, and I'm going to need the following areas, uh, potentially. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Now, each letter corresponds to the area in which it happens to be sitting in. And we want to ask the following questions. What is the effect from the tariff on the consumers who purchase the product in the U.S. market? So the change in consumer surplus as a result of the tariff. Yeah? Um, but did it decrease by A plus B plus C plus D plus H? Absolutely. Okay, so the original price is PFT. The U.S. price rises up to PUST. Consumers, the demand curve is out here. So consumers are going to lose minus A plus B plus C plus D. Okay, what's the change in producer surplus? How are producers affected in the U.S. as a result of the tariff being put into place? Go ahead. Uh, increased by E. By what? E. Not E. Not E. Producers? Oh, okay, never mind. Try again. Well, so we move from FT to T. We're moving from PFT to PUST up here. Okay. Supply curve is here. A. It's going to be area A. So originally, producers are getting surplus given by this triangular area. Now that the price in the U.S. has risen up to PUST, producers are getting this larger triangular area. Okay. So the addition is plus A. Now the last thing is what is the change in government revenue or tariff revenue? It's going to be equal to the value of the tariff times the quantity of imports, which is SUST minus DUST. That product is what area on the graph? Hey. Huh? I want to redeem myself. Is it um C plus G? C and G. So the 
usually students might look at this and say it's just area C, but it's not because it's the difference between PUST and PBT. That's the tariff. That's the height. This is the import level there. So we're taking that height times that length, and we're getting area C plus G. That's a positive benefit for the economy because because government is collecting revenue, they're then spending that on something good and productive, like new roads or new parks or something like that. All right, so um, that's a benefit to the economy that we're representing there. So we end up with a redistribution, if you will. Consumers lose because of the tariff, just like in a small country case. Producers benefit in that industry because of the tariff and the protection. And uh, the government collects some money and distributes it to people and helps uh, people become better off. So, you know, we've got two positive effects, one negative effect. You might say, oh, well, you know, maybe this is, this is good for the country. But let's take a look at what the change in national welfare is. And what we do is we add up the effects up here. So the A's cancel on the first two lines. The C's cancel on the first and the third line. And we're going to be left with the change in national welfare is G minus B minus D. Now, this is a little bit different than the small country case because we've got the inclusion of this area G, <clears throat> which didn't exist in the small country case. And what's more, G is a positive area. It's adding to the national welfare in total. So just looking at this and kind of eyeballing it, just look at the graph. Area G is that big rectangle, right, that G is sitting in. B and D are those little triangles. Just from my graph, if you were to ask, if I were to ask you, does it look like national welfare change is positive or negative, what does it look like? Positive. Looks positive, right? Because area G looks much bigger than the combination of B and D together. So if I add them all up, I should end up with a positive effect of the tariff. The tariff in this case looks like it's going to raise up the national welfare. And indeed, it can. But it can also lower national welfare. It depends on the value of the tariff. And I'm going to address that and look at that in a few minutes. But the interesting case is actually that the tariff can raise up the national welfare in this particular case. It can make the country better off. It can increase economic efficiency, in other words. Protection can be good. And it is good, in some circumstances, in a large country case. All right, so let's keep track of that. And then we're going to come back and look at that in some more detail. But before we do that, let's move on and look at what happens in Brazil. Okay, now Brazil, I'm going to draw these lines here. I'm going to mark off areas A, capital B, capital C, and capital D. Now, I'm not making them small letters because I, don't, I want to distinguish them from the other areas on the U.S. graph. So if I drew two little A's, then I don't know which A I'm referring to, and the two little A's won't have the same number associated with that. So capital A is meant to represent the area in which capital A is sitting, this this quadrilateral here. B is this little triangle, C is this rectangle, and so forth and so on. And they're caps to distinguish them from the U.S. letters, which are different values. Now in Brazil, the price is getting pushed downward. In Brazil, suppliers are reducing their supply overall and cutting back their production because of the lower price. Consumers are consuming more in Brazil because they get to buy the product at a lower price. All right, but we can ask, well, what is the change in consumer surplus in Brazil as a result of the U.S. tariff? Now, the answer is going to be the area between the price that prevailed originally, the price that prevailed after the U.S. tariff was imposed, carried out to the demand curve. Area? Not B. B is above the demand curve, so we don't want to include it. So just area A. Is it a positive or negative effect for consumers? Positive. positive. Consumers are going to become better off from the U.S. tariff. Yeah, Brazilians can drink more coffee. They can buy more. It's going to be cheaper. Good things for them because the U.S. is protecting its market. But what about Brazilian producers? The change in producer surplus is the area between the price that prevailed originally, the price that prevailed afterwards, and the supply curve going to be? Minus A, B, C, D. All of that is going to be a loss to producers. Minus A plus B plus C plus D. Producers lose. Now, 
There's no government action taking place in Brazil. They're not putting a tariff or a subsidy. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting back and watching it happen. So there's no government effect in Brazil. So that means the change in national welfare in Brazil, this is U.S. welfare over there, change in national welfare in Brazil is going to be equal to the sum of these. The A's cancel out. I'm going to be left with minus B minus C minus D. So on the graph, it looks like the U.S. is actually making itself better off with its tariff, like I've applied here, just visually, graphically there. But Brazil is actually being made worse off as a result of the tariff. So the U.S.'s benefit, in this case, actually comes at the expense of the other country in the aggregate. But keep in mind, everybody in Brazil is not made worse off. Producers are made worse off, consumers are made better off, but the net effect is negative. So the national welfare effect in Brazil is negative, but there's still a redistribution that's taking place with some winners and losers in both of the countries. Yeah? So the consumption efficiency goes up in Brazil? Actually, there's a loss of consumption efficiency and a loss in production efficiency, despite the fact that the consumers are benefiting with lower prices. So the efficiency effects are the net effects that come about, not the gross effects of who benefits plus or minus. All right, that's a little bit tricky. Yeah. I, think I was trying to understand this too. It's, it's sort of more that they're producing less and consuming less overall than they would be if they were trading, correct? Exactly. Exactly. So we're encouraging more consumption of coffee really in Brazil than is ideal for Brazil to consume, given the market situation. We're sort of artificially inducing an overconsumption, and that actually causes an efficiency loss, which is given by area little b here. So there's a loss in consumption efficiency. It's hard to figure out, and I'm not sure I can give a good um, explanation of it. But that's technically what's going on. There's a loss in production efficiency given by area D. So there's actually a loss in efficiency in, a, in the Brazilian market overall, too, despite the gains and losses to the two different groups. We're like inducing an improper allocation of goods worldwide, and it's leading to losses in efficiency in both respects. Now, I want to take a look, and this area C is left over, and I want, to, I want to highlight one more thing here. We could calculate the change in world welfare, WW. The change in world welfare is going to be the summation of the changes in welfare in the U.S. and Brazil. So it's going to be a, a summation of the change in national welfare in the U.S. plus the change in national welfare in Brazil. And that's going to be equal to, we'll just add these up together, we're going to end up with G minus little b minus little d minus capital B minus capital C minus capital D. I've got one positive area and five negative areas, but I can actually simplify this because by looking at the graph, it's not too hard to figure out that area G, which has height given by PFT minus PBT, and C also has the same height. And G has length given by the amount of imports into the U.S., which have to be equal to the amount of exports by Brazil, which is equal to that distance there. So area C and area G are exactly the same size. Therefore, I can cancel them out from each other, leaving me with a change in national welfare in the world of minus B minus D minus cap B minus cap D. Or in other words, all we end up with, because of the large country putting the tariff in the place, is a collection of inefficiencies, both production and consumption inefficiencies in both countries. There's a net loss to the world as a result of the tariff being put into place. Now, what that's going to mean is that if the U.S. puts a tariff into place at the right level to raise up its national welfare, it's going to cause a loss in national welfare to Brazil by an amount that's greater than the benefit that accrues to the U.S. because the summation of the effect has to be negative. It also means that the U.S. can only benefit itself by basically hurting its trading partners by even more than it's benefiting itself. So you can gain in the international marketplace through trade, but only in what's sometimes called a beggar thy neighbor kind of policy. I can only win if I hurt others to a greater extent. And that's one of the implications of a tariff in a large country case.
Now, the next thing we're going to do is take a look at under what circumstances it's likely for the tariff to raise national welfare for the U.S. and in what circumstances it does not. Raising welfare for the U.S. and the country of the United We want to find out under what circumstances the tariff will raise welfare for the U.S. and when it will not. That's our question. Yeah. The tariff will always lower welfare for the other country. And in fact, the other country will always suffer greater and greater welfare losses the bigger the tariff we put into place. So basically, put a small tariff into place, Brazil is hurt overall. Put a bigger tariff into place, Brazil gets hurt more. Keep raising the tariff, Brazil's welfare goes down, 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 down. Okay, so Brazil just gets hurt whenever the U.S. puts the tariff in place in this circumstance or situation. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw another diagram freehand. And on the diagram, I'm going to plot the following. Uh, on the horizontal axis, I'm going to plot the tariff rate. With this being a zero tariff, and I'm going to mark off another important tariff rate that we're going to want to identify, and that's this one here. Call it T sub P. T sub P is the prohibitive tariff in this particular market. Now, we're looking at just one market here. So we're just looking at a product like coffee. And we're asking how things are going to change at different tariff rates applied on this particular product like coffee. So we can set a zero tariff. This would be free trade. Or we could set a prohibitive tariff, and that would get us back to autarky. Or we could set some tariff in between that range, or even greater than it. We could put a tariff at any level. All right, now I'm going to go back and ask the question, if we have free trade, oh, on the vertical axis, I'm going to plot welfare. And we're measuring welfare in dollar terms using our surplus measures or our tariff revenue measures. So welfare is being measured in dollar terms along the vertical axis. Now, suppose we're in free trade and we have a zero tariff into place. And go back to this particular diagram, and I could ask a question like, how much consumer surplus is accruing to consumers when we're in the free trade equilibrium with the price PFT? And the answer would be some number that's associated with the area of this triangle. Right, this whole triangle is going to be the amount of consumer surplus that arises when the country is in free trade. That's some number. Now, if we're in free trade at this price, we could ask, well, what is the, this is the supply in free trade, we could ask, what is the producer surplus that arises when we're in the free trade equilibrium in the U.S. at PFT? The answer to that is going to be this area right here, that triangle. So, when we're in free trade, consumer surplus, again, is this big triangle, the area of that, and producer surplus is this smaller triangle. So, I don't know what the values are, but I know that consumer surplus in free trade should be quite a bit bigger than producer surplus in free trade from the graph, and so I'm going to plot it accordingly. Come back over here, I'm going to mark on the vertical axis some level of surplus, I'm going to call that producer surplus in free trade. And I'm going to pick some number up here and let that represent consumer surplus in free trade. Again, corresponding to the areas on the graph. Now, suppose we put a tariff into place. What happens to producer surplus? Does it go up or go down as we increase a tariff from zero? I'll ask it again. What happens to producer surplus as we increase the tariff in this market? It's going to go up. As you raise the tariff, the price to producers rise, they expand their production, they get more surplus. In fact, as we go up in price from here to here with the tariff, producer surplus increases by area A. But the small effect, raising it from, from a zero tariff to a slightly positive tariff, we're going to add on producer surplus given by this distance between the, ver uh, the vertical axis and the supply curve. We're going to keep adding more and more and more and more as we increase the tariff. So producer surplus is going to go up as we increase the tariff. Does 
and it's going to continue to go up until we get to autarky. What happens to consumer surplus as we increase the tariff? It goes down because consumer surplus is actually falling with an increase in the domestic price and it's going to fall at first by this much then a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. Each tariff is going to continue to decrease consumer surplus as the tariff is increased. But notice that the rate of change of producer surplus is going to be smaller than the rate of change in the decreasing direction of consumer surplus. In other words, consumer surplus is going to go down by at first this amount, while producer surplus is going to go up by at first this amount. Consumer surplus goes down faster than producer surplus goes up. Now, that means the following. Producer surplus starts at this level, and as I increase the tariff, it's going to rise. I'm going to draw an upward sloping line that kind of keeps rising, 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 until I get to the prohibitive tariff right here. Now, once we get to the prohibitive tariff, if I keep raising the tariff higher and higher, I get stuck in autarky. There's going to be no effect upon the domestic price any further, and what that means is that the level of welfare is going to level off and become a straight line. This is going to be producer surplus at different levels of tariff. Consumer surplus. As I increase consumer, I increase the tariff, consumer surplus is going to go down. But it's going to go down at a faster rate than producer surplus went up. So I'll exaggerate that a little bit, maybe. I'm going to have consumer surplus go down, 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 down. Maybe it'll cross producer surplus line. Maybe it won't. Doesn't matter. What matters is the slopes of these relative to each other. So that looks like a steeper slope than that's a positive slope upward. A little bit. And that's going to mean consumer surplus is going to follow this pattern as I increase the tariff. Now, the next thing I'm going to compare is what would be national welfare if I have a zero tariff or I'm in free trade? And the answer to that national or market welfare in a free trade equilibrium is going to be the summation of consumer and producer surplus, right? So I'm going to take those two, take that distance, add it on top of this, and I'm going to get my national welfare in free trade is right up here. Now let's compare that to the national welfare I'm going to get if I have a prohibitive tariff in place. The prohibitive tariff, I'm going to take this distance, which is consumer surplus, add it on top of the producer surplus, and I'm going to get a value that looks something like this. This is that distance on top of that, right? Just kind of flip it over. And this is going to be national welfare in autarky. And it's going to actually balance out and become like this. This is the national welfare function. This is national welfare in autarky. <coughs> Because of the differences in the slopes, because the consumer surplus falls faster than producer surplus goes up, the value of national welfare in autarky has to be lower than the value of national welfare in free trade. So in making a comparison of trade versus no trade, trade is always better for a large country and for a small country. So that's a, that's a, a regularity that we're going to see in these particular kind of trade models. Trade is always better than no trade. Okay, now I've ignored a little bit what happens in the middle because there's one more factor we have to incorporate into the mix of things, and that is the tariff revenues. The government's collecting tariff revenues for different taxes that are being implemented. But I could ask some easy questions first. How much tariff revenue does the government collect if it sets a tariff of zero? Zero. So let's mark that up. Zero tariff revenue if the tariff is zero. How much tariff revenue do they collect if the tariff is set at the prohibitive tariff rate? Zero. Because at the high tariff rate, you've now eliminated trade with the other country and not taxing anything because there's nothing to tax. So at a prohibitive tariff rate, government revenue is zero. Now, do you think it's positive somewhere in between? Absolutely. Government does collect tariff revenue sometimes. So if you put a non-prohibitive tariff into place, you're going to collect some revenue. But continuously moving from this point to this point with different tariffs, we have to have a nice smooth function that goes up and then comes back down. 
so that the tariff revenue function is going to look something like this. Okay? It's supposed to hit at that TP point at the, at the origin. And I don't know, maybe it'll be here, maybe it'll be up here, I don't know. But it's going to go up and then it's going to come back down and end up back at zero. Now, that leads to some interesting conclusions that we should stop a minute and, and recognize. First of all, there will be a tariff right here that I can call TMR, subscript MR. And MR here stands for maximum revenue. That is the tariff that would give the government the highest revenue stream possible in this particular market by setting this particular policy. Okay, so wherever the revenue, the tariff revenue curve is at a peak, that's the maximum revenue tariff. But suppose I started with a tariff, we get some interesting conclusions here. Like let's say we start with a really high tariff on a particular product like this. And let's suppose I lower the tariff. What happens to tariff revenue if I lower the tariff from this point like that? From here to here. It goes up. So I could lower the tariff and actually increase my tariff revenues. And that will definitely be true in the very high tariff range. But if I lower the tariff slightly from this point, then tariff revenue is going to go down. Now we fall into a pattern of thinking, oh, lower the taxes, that's going to lower our revenue. Raise the taxes, it's going to increase our revenue. But we have to remember that where that the tax increases or decreases are also changing the behavior of the people on the other side. And as you raise taxes, you lower the activity. So there's going to be a trade-off between there. And there's going to be a range where the quantity effect will outweigh the price effect and vice versa. All right, now, to find out what happens to national welfare along the tariff rates that might be applied, we want to add up the producer surplus plus the consumer surplus plus the government revenue to get the national welfare. Now, it's easy at these two extremes, but we have to add, for example, this plus this plus this in order to get the total effects. Okay? I have to add this plus this plus this to get the total effects. And here's what's going to happen in a large country case. So I can't prove it diagrammatically, but I'm just going to show you what happens in a large country case. If we add up those effects vertically to get the national welfare effects as we change the tariff, it's going to look something like this. <coughs> and the most important part of this diagram is that national welfare goes up for a period of time after we increase the tariff from zero. National welfare in a large country case, this has got to be a large country case. In a large country case, there's going to be an increase in the national welfare for a small increase in the tariff up to some point. Now this point at the maximum, we're going to call that tariff, we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it the optimal tariff or optimum. The tariff that raises national welfare to the highest extent possible is the optimal tariff. Oh, one more regularity. That will be true if you did the math. I'm not going to ask you to do the math. The math tells us that the optimal tariff is always lower than the maximum revenue tariff. That will always be true. Optimal tariff is always going to be lower than the maximum revenue tariff. But once we push the tariff above the optimal rate, national welfare is going to start to fall. Now, we will reach a point. I don't have a name for this tariff. But we will reach a point like that where once we get beyond that tariff rate, national welfare is going to fall below the level that persisted or existed in free trade. As long as we keep the tariff in this range, we're going to be better off as a country than we were in free trade. So there's going to be a range of tariffs on the low end wherein a large country is actually going to be better off with a small level of protection than it would be in free trade. Protection, small amount of protection for a large importing country is going to be better than free trade in a large country case.
Now learn this diagram, because this diagram will be the basis for answering lots of questions that I might ask you. I'll say, so I'll give you some examples of the types of questions I might ask you. And I, you know, you've seen I have lots of like questions that have plus, minus, zero, and ambiguous. I love those questions. You know why? They test a lot of knowledge, and they're incredibly easy to grade. There's no, there's no ambiguity to the answers. It's very objective. Okay, so here's the kind of question I might ask you. Suppose we start out, we have a large importing country, and it has, it's in free trade. Let's suppose that that country increases its tariff. I'm not telling you how much it's increasing its tariff. It just raises its tariff from zero. Now I might ask you, what happens to consumers in that market as a result of the increase in the tariff? Plus, minus, zero, or ambiguous? Start at zero, increase the tariff. Doesn't matter how much I increase it. Consumer surplus goes down, so consumers are worse off as a result of the tariff. What happens to producers? Better or worse off in that market? Better off. Producer surplus goes up. Okay, what happens to government revenue? Positive, negative, zero, ambiguous. Huh? Ambiguous. Ambiguous. So it goes up, doesn't it? Well, the answer ambiguous is right, but sometimes I'm going to throw in one additional caveat. I'm going to say, suppose there's an increase in the tariff from zero that does not result in a prohibitive tariff. If that extra clause were thrown in, then what's the answer to the effect on government revenue? then it's got to be positive, because if I increase the tariff at all to this level, to this level, to this level, to this level, I'm always going to be positive. But if I increase the tariff so high that it becomes a prohibitive tariff from zero, so I raise my tariff from zero to a thousand percent, guess what? There's no effect on government revenue, because it was zero, it remains zero. So it could be no effect or it could be positive. And that makes the answer ambiguous. But if I add in that clause, the final effect is not prohibitive, then you know that the tariff is being increased into this range. And then the tariff has to have caused an increase in revenue relative to the zero tariff. So the answer would be positive in that case. Okay, what's the effect on national welfare if I increase the tariff from zero and I don't, and it's a non-prohibitive tariff? Positive, negative, zero, or ambiguous? It's going to be ambiguous. If I increase the tariff a little bit, say to here, national welfare is going to go up. But if I increase the tariff to this rate here, national welfare is going to go down. Could go up, could go down, could stay exactly the same if I increase the tariff to this rate right here. So there's lots of different outcomes that can, ab- and can arise. The answer is ambiguous. I don't know what's going to happen to national welfare with the information that's been given. It's ambiguous. Okay, let me give you a different one. Suppose I begin with the optimal tariff, and I lower the tariff. So I start with the tariff, optimal tariff, and I lower the tariff. What happens to consumers? Better or worse off, ambiguous or zero? Better Better off. Moving up along this line, consumers are better off. What happens to producers? Worse off. off. Moving down along this line. What happens to government revenue? Goes down, right? Because we're moving down along this line to the left. And what happens to national welfare? Definitely negative. Moving in this direction, we're moving down closer to the free trade level. So we've got definitive answers to all of those questions. So that graph becomes incredibly helpful in answering lots of questions. Suppose we start with a tariff, any tariff. I don't know what tariff. It's a non-prohibitive tariff. Okay, I've got a tariff in place, and I'm going to lower the tariff. I don't know how much. Got a tariff in place, non-prohibitive, I'm going to lower the tariff. What's the effect on consumers? Got some tariff, I don't know which, I'm going to lower it. What happens to consumers? Plus, minus, zero, or ambiguous? Plus. Moving up along the consumer surplus line. What happens to producers? Negative. What happens to government revenue? Don't know. Don't know if I lowered this tariff. Don't know if I lowered this tariff. 
don't know where I am, don't know where I ended up. Could be positive, could be negative, could be zero. Ambiguous effect on national welfare. I'm sorry, on government revenue. What's the effect on national welfare? Yes. Ambiguous too, because I got this, this hump there. Could be to the left, could be to the right, I don't know. Ambiguous effect on national welfare. Ambiguous in these, ans in these questions almost exclusively show up on the national rev uh, welfare and on the uh, government revenue term. That's where we've got the up and downs. Consumer surplus is usually definitive, unless I haven't ruled out that prohibitive case. Then we could end up in an ambiguity on the consumer and producer surplus. Okay. Suppose we had a small country instead of a large country. Here's something that's rather interesting. If I had a small country, the consumer surplus line plotted across different tariff rates would look exactly like this. The producer surplus line would look exactly like this in shape. And the government revenue would look exactly like this. But there would be differences in the shape of the curves that were sufficient to cause the national welfare line in the small country case to look like this. National welfare falls continuously with increases in tariffs for a small country. But for small countries, there's still ambiguity potentially because of the, national, the government revenue term. Government revenue is still going to rise up in a small country case and it's going to fall back down to zero if a small country puts a prohibitive tariff into place. The reason for the differences between the two, despite the fact that the lines look similar, has to do with the curvature of those individual lines. And you can't see that from the diagrams, but we were able to show it explicitly in the diagrams when we did the national welfare effects. So it's in there, but it's hard to see, and if you did the mathematics, we'd be able to prove it. All right, but that's the difference. Now, I could ask you the same kind of questions in a small country case. Start out with a zero tariff, you increase the tariff, what happens to national welfare, for example? Small country case. Zero tariff, we raise the tariff, what happens? National welfare has to go down now. What's the optimal tariff in a small country case? Free trade or zero tariff. Zero tariff is the optimal. So a small country does have an optimal tariff. It's just no tariff. That's going to give you the highest level of national welfare in the small country case. So free trade is the best policy for a small country. It is not the best policy for a large country. Okay, so developing countries. Think around the world and think about lots of developing countries. Are those generally big economies or small economies? Small. So you take a country like, I don't know, a small African country, Malawi or Mali or Ghana. And all of those are relatively small economies compared to the world, right? And you look out there and you say, what kind of policies do they have in place with respect to trade? Do they tend to have low tariffs? Because we've shown that low tariffs are the best policy for small countries. Or do they have high tariffs? High tariffs. All right, and when you say to them in trade negotiations, hey, it'd be a really good idea for you to lower your tariffs. It will help you. It will have no effect upon the rest of the world because you're too small to influence trade, but it will help you. They say, no, we don't want to do that. We want to keep the high tariffs in place because we think it's better for us. Hmm. Okay. Now, large countries like the United States we go around the world, or at least we did in the past. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but in the past, we went around the world and we proclaimed the benefits of free trade. We said, freer trade is the way to go. Lower your tariffs. Lower them to zero. Let's have these free trade agreements. What's the best policy for a large importing country like the United States? Tariffs. Optimal tariffs. Some tariffs in place. Some levels of protection. Now, if we went around and calculated the optimal tariffs in the steel industry, the auto industry, you know, the tobacco industry any product that we might import from the rest of the world, we would probably find that the optimal tariffs in the U.S. are somewhat, you know, they're probably, it's a small tariff maybe, maybe 5% or 10% ad valorem. Might be the optimal tariff in a lot of products. 
For some goods, it might be higher. It all depends on the elasticities of demand and supply and the effect that you can have on the price in the rest of the world. That's going to vary from market to market to market. So every product line will have a different optimal tariff. But we could figure out what it is. It's probably in, like I said, the 5 to 10% range for most goods. What's the average tariff in the United States right now? About 3% or so. When we do the unweighted tariff, if we do the weighted tariff, it's like 1.2% or something. So that seems to suggest that if we lowered average tariffs, because we're already below the optimals, we're quite likely to make ourselves worse off. So movements to freer trade are actually going to make large countries like the U.S. worse off. Now, there's a little bit of ambiguity there because we do have high tariffs in like agricultural goods. We've got tariffs in the 20% range. We've got a tobacco tariff of 350%. So those are tariffs which we could lower and probably raise up our national welfare. But even agricultural tariffs, we may lower them from 20% and actually maybe the optimal is going to be at 10 or 15%. We don't really want to lower them too much because we're gaining some advantage by having the tariffs in place. But we don't do that. In fact, nowhere in our history has the government ever come, listened to economics lessons like this, and said, hey, we ought to calculate the optimal tariff. That would be a great idea. Why don't we do that and implement that as a policy? Nobody's ever thought to do that. How long have we known this? We've known about optimal tariffs since about the 1840s. OK, so we've known that free trade is not the best policy for large countries for over, we're getting close to 200 years now. And yet, no government has ever thought to do that. Now, one reason might be they don't listen to economists ever. But a second reason, and a third reason, might be that they're not really, one reason would be maybe they're not really interested in national welfare. Maybe that's not the objective of government. And then we get into political arguments and think, well, who is it that talks to governments and tells them and suggests what sorts of policies to implement? Nobody speaking for the nation. But you have lots of people speaking for individual groups, interest groups, and lobbying for support of different types of policies. Okay. So maybe, maybe that's what's going on here. And then another thing that might be going on here, and we'll get to this at the end of the course, last couple of lectures, is we might well have some other things going on that we haven't incorporated into our nice, simple model here. And we'll incorporate some other things in the last two lectures, and we'll talk about those. OK, so just keep that in mind. We'll come back and talk more about that. Now, there's one other thing I want to talk about here. So this suggests that maybe a large country would be best off if it could put optimal tariffs into place. But I'm going to give you an argument now for why maybe we really don't want to do that as a large country. And I'm going to tell you the story by creating a little bit of a game. We do some game theory. Let us suppose that we have two countries, the United States and Brazil, just like in our story before. And let's imagine that the players of our game that we're creating here are the two governments of the US and Brazil. Now, the US and the Brazilian government, we're going to imagine, have to choose a trade policy. And there's lots of trade policies that governments might choose. They could set zero tariffs. They could set prohibitive tariffs. They could set different tariffs on different products at different levels. They could do all sorts of different things. But we don't want to consider all of those because it's too complicated. So we're going to simplify our story to two simple decisions for the governments to make. Let's suppose that the United States can choose to set free trade, zero tariffs on everything, or they might choose to set optimal tariffs. U.S. has two policy choices, free trade or set optimal tariffs. U.S. is a large country, we're imagining. Now, Brazil is the other country in the world. And by virtue of having two countries that are the only countries in the world trading with each other, it almost guarantees that both countries are large. So we're going to imagine that Brazil is a large country, too. And Brazil also has the two policy options. They can choose free trade and set zero tariffs on all of their imports, or they could choose optimal tariffs. Now, in this particular analysis, we are going to imagine that the two countries are importing lots and lots of goods from each other. So Brazil is importing thousands of different products 
from the U.S., and the U.S. is importing thousands of other products from Brazil. So we're each specializing in kind of our comparative advantage goods. We're exporting goods back and forth to each other. We're importing from each other. But it's a different set of goods that are going back and forth between the countries, let's imagine. All right, so when Brazil puts tariffs into place, they're putting them on a different set of goods than when the U.S. puts tariffs into place. All right? Now, we're going to imagine, maybe bravely, that the U.S. and Brazilian governments care only about the national welfare. They care about what's best for their nation overall, adding up all the positive and negative effects that are likely to accrue. And we're going to use our tariff analysis examples to calculate potential returns to the individual countries. Here's how we're going to do it. Let's imagine that in free trade, that we normalize the welfare levels of the two countries to 100 units, like an index approach. So let's say in free trade, the US gets 100 units of well-being for the nation. And Brazil, setting also free trade, gets 100 units of welfare. So that's going to be our baseline case. Free trade, free trade, zero tariffs everywhere, 100 units of welfare for the two individual countries. Now, let's suppose that we jump over to this box. In this box, the U.S. is going to set optimal tariffs on its thousands of imported goods from Brazil, picking the best tariff for each individual item. 3% here, 10% there, 15% there. Properly chosen to get you to the highest level of welfare. Brazil is going to pursue free trade and set zero tariffs on all of its imports from the U.S. So we want to ask, from our tariff analysis case that we did for one industry, how would that affect welfare for the United States moving from free trade to optimal tariffs? Up or down? Up. OK. How would it affect welfare for Brazil going from free trade to US setting optimal tariffs? Down. We saw that welfare in the market would go down, so cross the um, add it up across thousands of markets, Brazil's welfare is going to go down. But lastly, we can ask what happens to the summation of welfares for the two countries combined. And there we know the answer too. The world welfare is going to go down. So what I need is to put a number over here in this box such that U.S. welfare goes up, Brazil welfare goes down by more than that, so that the sum is less than 200. So let's make up a number. Let's say U.S. goes up to 120, Brazil's falls to 70. The summation of the two is 190 units now. It was 200 over here. And let's say that's the outcome for the countries if the U.S. puts optimal tariffs and Brazil does not. Now, let's flip it around. Brazil puts optimal tariffs into place, U.S. pursues free trade. Let's imagine the two countries are equal in size, just to keep things simple. Then Brazil's welfare is going to go up to 120. Brazil, uh, U.S.'s is going to drop to 70. U.S. is in the upper diagonal. Brazil's number is always in the lower diagonal, as it's indicated up here. Now, lastly, let's suppose they decide to put optimal tariffs in place against each other simultaneously. Now, let's imagine also that the markets are kind of disjoint joint from each other. So our putting tariffs into place don't affect the goods that are flowing in the other direction, and so forth. So let's imagine we get the, an equal amount of effect in the two countries by jumping over here. So we can start at either this point or this point and jump over to this, this box. So let's say U.S. has optimal tariffs in place originally, Brazil does not, and we consider starting from this corner diagonal box to this one for Brazil to be adding optimal tariffs. And we're going to do it the following way. When Brazil adds tariffs over here, they get 20 units of extra welfare as a nation. So we're going to just add that onto their welfare over here if they add optimal tariffs on top of the U.S.'s optimal tariffs. So 70 plus 20, it's going to give Brazil 90 units of welfare over here. And U.S.'s welfare is falling by 30 in this direction. It's going to fall by 30 here, so 120 minus 30 going to give the U.S. 90 units of welfare. So that's what we'd expect to be the welfare levels if the two countries pursued optimal tariffs against each other. Now, we could ask, let's suppose these two countries decide to play this game against each other. What should they do? Well, we could ask, analyze the question in the following way. Let's say the U.S. has no idea what Brazil is going to do, but they know the values that go into all of these boxes. And they're inclined to want to do nothing but 
what's best for their own citizens. So they want to maximize their own national welfare. So the U.S. looks at the possibilities and says, well, let's, let's just work it out. Let's suppose Brazil decides to pursue free trade. We might ask, what should the U.S. do if that were Brazil's choice? Yeah, optimal tariffs will give them 120 rather than 100. So if Brazil did choose free trade, I don't know what they're going to do yet, but if they chose free trade, U.S. should probably choose optimal tariffs. Now, suppose Brazil didn't choose that. Suppose they chose the other only other pro policy choice of optimal tariffs. What should the U.S. do in that circumstance? Well, 90 is better than 70 there, so optimal tariffs would be chosen there. So really, there's no like difficult choice here. U.S. should definitely choose optimal tariffs because it doesn't matter what Brazil does, optimal tariffs are always going to be best for the U.S. We call optimal tariffs for the U.S. the dominant strategy because it dominates the other choice always. Now, if we did the same exercise for Brazil, we'd find exactly the same thing. If the U.S. chose free trade, Brazil would say, hey, let's do optimal tariffs, that's best for us. And if the U.S. chose optimal tariffs, Brazil would say, let's do optimal tariffs because that's best for us. So that gives us this as the equilibrium if the two countries do not cooperate with each other. The non-cooperative equilibrium is also called the Nash equilibrium. And it's named for John Nash, Nobel Prize winning economist, mathematician, and the subject of the movie The Beautiful Mind. The Beautiful Mind. Now, look at this game and this outcome, and staring us right in the face is a better outcome for both of them. And you have to start to wonder, why on earth would they choose what's best for them and end up at a point 90-90, when I could see right there on the diagram that 100-100 would make both of them better off, right? Well, Non-cooperation leads to a worse outcome for both of them. It's a dilemma, and this game has come to be known, and this example of a game is known as a prisoner's dilemma, because the original time that this game was first introduced and discussed was a story about two individuals arrested for a crime that they committed together, put into separate interrogation booths, can't talk to each other or communicate with each other, non-cooperative, and they have to decide whether to confess to the crime or not. All right. Turns out that the prisoners' only incentive, their incentives individually, is to confess. They both confess. They both get convicted of long sentences. They go to prison. It's worse for them. If they both would have just not confessed, there wouldn't be enough evidence against them in the story, and they would be set free. But they each cheat on the others, essentially, and they end up going to. Now, that's a good outcome for society, but not a good outcome for the prisoners. And that's why it's the prisoner's dilemma, not society's dilemma. Anyway, the dilemma here is, why on earth would countries non-cooperating with each other actually choose something that's inferior to another outcome that's staring them in the face? The answer is they don't have any individual incentive to engage in free trade, free trade with each other. And so they get stuck in this kind of Nash equilibrium over here. Now, they can choose this. And we have a name for this particular outcome or equilibrium. We call it a cooperative equilibrium. And the cooperative equilibrium is the equilibrium that would be found in a game like this that maximizes the sum total welfare that accrues to the two parties. That's the 200 up here, which is greater than the 190s on the diagonals, cross diagonals, and is greater than the 180 that's over here. So the best outcome from a cooperative perspective is to choose free trade, free trade. Okay, now, back to our story. Why should the U.S. not just get its maximum benefit for itself and set optimal tariffs? Well, one reason they might not do that is because we don't live in a world of only one large country. We live in a world of multiple large countries, and if we put large high tariffs into place or optimal tariffs and tried to pull welfare in our markets at the expense of everybody else, well, then everybody else that's large might do the same thing and we could end up in a worse outcome for all of us. We could end up in a prisoner's dilemma kind of outcome. So non-cooperation leads us to this prisoner's dilemma outcome if we could simply sit down, discuss it, look at the numbers together, and handshake on it and say, let's go back and let's each implement free trade, free trade. Then we'll both be able to get the 100-100. We would have a better outcome 
for the countries and for the people involved. All right, now, here comes an argument, then, for why we have an organization like the WTO or the GATT. Because here's kind of what happened. Let's imagine, and I, I can't tell the story explicitly this, when the, the story about the GATT and the WTO is not really a story about optimal tariff setting. But it is, a, it is a story about prisoners' dilemmas. And the dilemma that countries got into is that they have an individual incentive oftentimes to protect their markets with high tariffs. But if every country protects its markets with high tariffs, as happened in the 1930s after we implemented the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, then we end up with a much worse condition for everybody involved. So if everybody tries to individually improve their welfare by putting high tariffs into place because it's in their own best interest to do that, but everybody does exactly the same thing, then we end up in a worse outcome for everybody. It's a prisoner's dilemma. Now, what's happened kind of is these kind of numbers, U.S. and Brazil and Mexico and Britain didn't put up optimal tariffs in the 1930s. Instead, what we did is we moved like way over here, you know, the 65% tariffs. And the other countries, well, they moved way down here so that we ended up in a box down here in the Great Depression years, right? Individually, best for us to do, but bad from a societal or world welfare point of view. So the question then becomes, how do we get from this bad equilibrium where everybody has high tariffs against each other to a good equilibrium that's up here, free trade, free trade? Well, the answer from the model and from, story, from history is cooperation. What if we could get countries to come together and do something like this? Tell you what, we'll lower our tariffs a little bit if you lower your tariffs a little bit. And if we lower tariffs together, we'll move up along the diagonal and we'll make both of ourselves better off, moving to a better outcome for both of us. That's what the GATT is all about. Actually, that's what the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act back in 1934 was all about. You lower yours a little, we'll lower ours a little bit, we'll move closer to that better outcome. We won't get there exactly you know, tomorrow. We won't get to free trade, but we're moving in the right direction of trade liberalization. And it's kind of like trying to get this kind of a jump in welfare, where both countries are going to become better off because they're cooperating with each other and we're solving the prisoner's dilemma story. The WTO is just an add-on to that, adding more markets and more issues. Liberalized together, we move upwards along the diagonal of this game, and we get closer and closer to a better outcome for both countries. That's the logic of trade liberalization, and it's the logic of the GATT and the WTO. Now, the WTO and the GATT also have dispute settlement mechanisms, right? The WTO says, hey, if you promise to move up into this box, let's say, and you didn't comply, and you renege because in the short run it's better for you to maybe implement some protectionist policies, then countries have an, um, an opportunity to dispute that. You go through an investigation process, you investigate whether a country really did violate the agreement. If they did, you say, hey, you violated it, you've got to move back to your commitment and move back to the diagonal. But if they don't agree to it, then you can suspend concessions guaranteeing that you're going to move back and slip and slide back down along the diagonal to the non-cooperative prisoner's dilemma kind of outcome. So every country, while they have an individual incentive to cheat from time to time, and they do that, the mechanism is designed to try to put the incentives in place to try to maintain a cooperative outcome with more trade liberalization to assure greater welfare for all of the countries combined. And that's the argument for the WTO.